Good morning, Mount Olive. We hope that you are having a great Friday. We hope that this week has been a blessing to you as you continue to walk and grow in your faith and in your discipleship with our Savior Jesus. So we just uh, pray God's blessings upon you this Friday, this day, and always. Uh, we're continuing on in our devotions looking at just the cast of characters that God gives us and interacts with in Scripture. And today we are going to be taking a look at how Jesus interacts with this man named Jairus. So Jairus is the leader of a synagogue. So is he a Pharisee? Maybe, maybe not, but he's probably in he's probably in a good circle with a number of Pharisees. Uh, he's kind of like the senior pastor for a church. And what we see here in this story is Jairus is out of options. What scripture tells us is that his little daughter, who's about 10 to 12-ish years old, is sick and that she is so sick that she is dying. And so in, if you have a Bible with you and you want to follow along with this story, uh, this story is found in Mark chapter 5. So the Gospel of Mark in chapter 5, we hear about Jesus interacting with this man named Jairus and how Jairus pleads for Jesus to come and heal his daughter. So I'm in Mark chapter 5. We are going to start at verse 21 if you have a Bible. So let's just go ahead. Let's jump right into it. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and was beside the sea. So again, Jesus is on the move. He's preaching, he's teaching, and he's healing. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed behind, followed him and thronged about him. So in this little bit of dialogue, you see Jairus he is completely out of options. He's probably tried healing. They've tried medicine or what would be at that day and age considered modern medicine. He's tried prayer. He's probably exhausted any and every resource he has, but nothing is working. Nothing is working. And so the only option that Jairus has left is that when Jesus gets relatively near to him, he speeds it, he books it, and he falls, he finds Jesus falls at his feet, which is a great sign of respect for Jesus. And it's a great sign of humility on Jairus's part saying, I am completely helpless. I can't do anything. Jesus, come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. What does that tell us about Jairus? He knows how powerful Jesus is. He knows that Jesus in some way, shape or form <clears throat> is connected to God. He's connected to God because he can and trusts and knows that Jesus is going to heal his little girl and he's going to make her get better. So again, that's a great display of faith for Jairus on this end. And I think what's also interesting about Jairus in this moment is we can all relate to him in some way, shape or form, whether you're a parent or not. We've all at some point probably felt completely helpless. Like we are out of options. We've exhausted everything that we know to do. We feel like we've done everything we can. And the only option for us is to go to Jesus, is to go to God, go to his word, and just ask for help because we know that God can do something. And it's not good or it's not bad, but I think a lot of us in some way, shape or form, we use the Bible as a last resource instead of a first response. Now, God gives us the gift of modern medicine. He gives us the gift of healing and medicine for our benefit. So that's good. I'm not knocking that in any way, shape, or form. But how often do you or I use scripture or use prayer or go to Jesus as a last resort? We try that when all else has failed versus is he a part of it from the beginning? If we're encountering some kind of struggle or some significant point in our lives that is really, really bad, or really, really, really traumatizing for us, what point does Jesus get into the equation for us? So Jairus is kind of split up into two sections, or at least Jesus's interaction with him. So Jesus gets ready. He doesn't book it. 
He doesn't say, okay, let's go. We got to get there as fast as we can. He starts walking with Jairus. So Jairus is probably thinking, man, Jesus, walk a little faster, man. My daughter is dying. We got to get there. And at some point along their journey from where Jairus finds Jesus to Jairus's house, there Jesus gets interrupted, so to speak, by a woman who's had a blood discharge for 12 years. And she grabs and was able to touch Jesus's coat. And Jesus stops and he looks for her and he. he uh, oh, sorry about that. If you uh, want to say I just got a notification that my my signal isn't great. So uh, let me know in the comments if you are still getting this, if you're still tracking with it, if we're having issues. So uh, back to what I was saying is Jesus heals this woman with a blood discharge in the middle of trying to walk to Jairus's house. So you got to imagine if you're Jairus in this moment, you're thinking, Jesus, there's no time. Le leave her be. We'll come back. You can get to her later. But right now, you got to take care of me. And I think what's interesting is that Jesus, he doesn't condemn Jairus, but he also doesn't turn this woman away either. He doesn't turn her away. So then while Jesus is talking to this woman and he's talking to the crowds after he heals her, <clears throat> Jairus gets word that, the word, the word that every parent hates to hear or never, ever wants to hear. And that is, your daughter has died. And so there's no point for Jesus anymore. But that doesn't stop Jesus. Jesus doesn't get deterred by death. Death does not get the final word when Jesus is in town. Jesus does not, Jesus is not afraid of death. He's not appalled by it. It doesn't discourage him. So as he continues to go and they find this lifeless daughter of Jairus, Jesus just looks at her. He tells everybody to get out. And he looks at her and he says, Talitha Kumi. This is in Mark 5, verse 41. Talitha Kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, rise. Little girl, I say to you, get up. Wake up. Verse 42, and immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and he told them to give her something to eat. Hey, she's been sleeping for a while. She probably needs something to eat. We can learn a lot from Jairus. We can learn a lot from Jesus in this text as well. And I think if we're Jairus, or you feel like you're Jairus in this moment, it can be really frustrating for us to maybe think Jesus needs to operate on our time, that our needs are greater or that we are in the greatest of need in whatever season of life you are. Whether you have somebody who's actively dying, whether you have somebody who's maybe not doing the greatest, or maybe it's you. Maybe you just feel like you are empty, you're out of options, and the only person that can help is Jesus. Jesus never ignores us. First and foremost, and that's not what Jesus is doing here. He's not ignoring Jairus and he's not prioritizing somebody's needs over this little girl. Jesus knows full well that this little girl is going to die, but he also knows that he's going to bring life to her, that he's going to raise this little girl from the dead, and he's going to give her something that is greater than just healing. He's going to give her a resurrection, and that's exactly what he does for Jairus. And that's exactly what he promises and assures us that we have in him, that we have a resurrection, that in Jesus, we have a resurrection, we have life, we have purpose, and that in him, we are never ignored. We are connected to Jesus through his word, through the washing waters of baptism, and we are connected to him whenever we eat and drink of his body and blood in holy communion. Jesus never ignores us. He never puts his needs above our own. He always prioritizes us. And we know that in him, at some point, he's going to speak to us and say, little girl or little boy, I say to you, get up, rise and walk and come get something to eat. When we get to join him in heaven at the feast with him and with all the saints who have gone before us and all the saints of heaven, Jesus says, it's time to get something to eat where we get to be with him for all of eternity. That's the hope and the sure hope that we have in our Savior, Jesus. So church, let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for today. 
Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for recording uh, this miraculous event between Jesus and Jairus. Lord, you know where every single one of us is at. You know those of us who maybe feel like Jairus right now, like we're out of options, like we have nowhere to turn, and that our only hope and our only answer is found in you. And Lord, we pray that you would work in our hearts and that you would work in our lives, that that we would not use you as a last resort, but we would use you instead as a first response. That in every need, good, bad, significant or insignificant, that you would be our first response, that you would be at the forefront and active in our lives and in our hearts and in all that we say and do by our actions, our words, and our and our thoughts. We would bring, we would bring honor and glory and praise to you. We pray all this in your most holy and powerful name. And all God's people said, amen. Church, thank you so much for joining us this week. Hit that share button. Let's reach out and engage other people with the life-saving, life-changing word of our Savior, Jesus. Uh, we just want to wish you a blessed weekend, and we would love to see you, and we can't wait to see you this weekend in worship in God's house. So we are so excited. Have a great rest of your weekend, and we will see you Sunday as we worship our risen King, Jesus Christ. Have a good rest of your day, and we'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.